Welcome back to uh, Raph Child Records via a YouTube channel. I'm Raph, and today I'm going to start a new series. It's going to be called The Scrolls of Skelos. Ain't that exciting? Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, what this will be is me talking about something else than just heavy metal. But don't worry, it's going to get back to heavy metal. What I'm going to talk about in this series is books in like the most wide definition of the word. I'm going to talk about books that have influenced heavy metal bands that I personally like, that hopefully some of you like. Some of them I've even released albums for. And yeah, I figure it's just like, you know, a good idea to um, talk about these kind of things um, where they, uh, you know, what those books are, give like a brief introduction, tell you where to find them, tell you so you can actually judge for yourself if it's something you really want to read to know more, or if it's something that's probably not for you. So yeah, that's sort of what I'm going to do. And when I say books, as I said, it's going to be all kinds of different kinds of books, mythologies included. There might be down the road one where I go into like the Odyssey or the Iliad. Maybe, maybe I'll even tackle the Bible. We'll see. I mean, there's a lot of Christian metal out there, so maybe someone should actually look at the Bible and tell you what it's all about. And there, there's fun stuff in there. So that's the idea of the Scrolls of Scalos. I hope you like it. If you have wishes for books that I should talk about, then drop that in the comments. And yeah, subscribe to the channel to find out when I talk about more books. So let's start by something I recently read. So that's where we're starting. It's the Kalevala, which is a Finnish book. But uh, first, uh, cheers. All right, so let's start talking about the Kalevala. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My Finnish is non-existent, which I suspect goes for like almost everyone in the world, maybe even some Finns. <laughs> um, okay, the Kalevala is what is loosely termed the Finnish national epic. And there's a couple of things we need to unpack in there. It was written by a guy called Elias uh, or Elias Lönnrot, which is a Swedish name, which makes it more interesting. But if you want to look into Finnish history and Swedish influence in Finnish history, go ahead. It's complicated. I'm neither Finnish nor Swedish, so I will not comment on that. Anyway, he was a doctor and he was interested in folklore, which is something that a lot of people started being interested in in the 19th century, like around the 1840s, around that time. It is also the time where a lot of countries in mostly Europe start becoming nation states. And part of that is trying to invent and construct some kind of national heritage, past, uh, that kind of thing. And with that goes having a national epic, like this mythology, mythological background that you can look at and identify as Finnish or German or Irish or whatever. So that's um, where the Kalevala comes in. It's people starting in general to walk into the like countryside, talk to old people, collect folk tales. In Germany, that was done by the Brothers Grimm, and we get those famous sadistic fairy tales for children, so they learn how to roll down people in nail-filled barrels. Um, and in Finland, a lot of people went to um, different villages. When I talk Finland in this case, it's sort of part of what was also Russia at the time, and it's mostly about a place called Karelia, because that's where like the Finnish national romantic, the heart of Finnish romantic nationalism sort of lay at the time. So people walk into the villages, talk to old folk singers and singers and collect their traditional songs, which maybe come back uh, way back from a pagan time, probably, some of them, some of them have also been influenced by Christianity, which has been in Finland at the time, at that point for a couple of hundred years. So, you know, it's like looking back and trying to figure out what the pagan times before Christianity were. It's also like something that happened a lot at the time in 
all of Europe, you know, it's like you figure out, oh, there's this Celtic heritage that we have and that nothing is left over because all the sources we have are either Julius Caesar or Christian monks writing it up. So let's just make up stuff. And I'm not saying this is what happened in the Kalevala, but there's certainly um, something that you have to understand when you read those tales is that they come from someone with a motive and a certain background. So Elias Lundrot, he is a doctor by like Stani, and he becomes a district overseer, like medicinal di district overseer. And as part of that job, he travels to all kinds of small villages as a doctor, and he collects, starts collecting these things, these poems, and publishing them. And at some point, he actually um, starts to organize them in some kind of overarching plots, some overarching narrative structure and there's all kinds of different tales in there but they're sort of ordered in some in a narrative structure from like you know the um, uh, creation of the world and it ends with this old age um, the age that he talks about ending and the main character of the Kalevala leaving the country because he's pissed Um, so that's what he does. I should say that he had this interest before he started collecting those folk tales and uh, stories and songs. He um, actually wrote his bachelor's thesis or master's thesis on one of these characters, uh, Veinemirinen or something. I don't know how to pronounce Finnish names. It's complicated. And he's the actual main character of the Kalevala. And he, he published a paper on this, like his thesis was on this um, personage. And then he went to uh, Helsinki and uh, became a med medical doctor. And then as a medical doctor, went back to studying folklore. So that's the background that we have. And the Kalevala is published in several editions in the 1850s, around 1850. You can look up the exact years. It's not that important, but that's around the time we're talking about. So what's actually in the book? The book is, as I said, an epic, which means it is an epic poem in a very specific meter that I'm not going to explain, but it is epic poetry in Finnish. Obviously, if you're not reading this in Finnish, it might not be in poetry. Some translations, some translators have tried to adapt that to some kind of meter, some kind of verse, but that's very, very difficult when you're trying to translate poetry, obviously. So it's uh, structured, it's ordered in 50 chapters or cantos, like poems, I guess you can say. And they start out with the creation of the, with like the creation myth, and then follow the exploits of a group of heroes, not really gods, maybe godlike heroes, it's kind of difficult to say. And there's like these 3.5, like maybe four heroes of Karelia, and then there's the people up in the north. A lot of that revolves about people from the south going to the north to get their women and being disappointed mostly. <laughs> there's a lot of very interesting stuff about the, that you can look at if you want to. And let's just say if that's a clear depiction of the um, <laughs> Finnish um, mentality when it comes to romantic involvement, it's problematic. But anyway, <laughs> we're going back. So it starts with the creation myth. Um, the world is created more or less by accident when the mother goddess drops the egg of a bird and it cracks. And out of that stuff, they create the world. And then is born her son, um, Vainamoin, and the great singer. He's, singing is very important in this um, whole myth. And uh, that's something that shows up later in all kinds of other books and songs that reference the Kalevala or are influenced by it. So singing is 
the way magic works in the Kalevala. It's like if people want to accomplish something maybe magical, they sing a mighty song or, or go um, looking for the words and the song to sing to accomplish something that happens later as well. So yeah, the land is created um, by song mostly. And uh, then we have, yeah, people living in the Kalevala land that is sort of run by Venemoinen. And he has a brother. His brother is Ilmarinen. He is the smith. And later on, we'll also meet Lemminkainen. That's like the three main guys in this area. And they all, after a while, go to, nor to the Northland to figure out stuff there. That's not all of it. There's also people in the Northland. Um, there's Lohi, the um, mistress of the North, who is sort of a uh, nemesis, I would say, to Vainamainen, but only sometimes and sometimes not. And there's like various other people with uh, weird names. But what when it starts all is when some later unimportant um, person from maybe Lapland, from the north, decides to, um, it's a young guy called Jokaheinen, and he starts to um, go to the south to um, pick a fight with Wainamoinen. And then something very Finnish happens, because Wainamoinen just sings him into the ground. <clears throat> That's literally what happens. Like, they both drive with their sleighs, and None, none of them wants to, like, uh, on a small track, none of them wants to move aside. And then Jokainen tries to uh, um, challenge Venomen into a fight. And he's like, no, I'll not fight for uh, with you. I'll not fight you. I'll just sing against you. And then Jokainen starts talking about what he knows and starts singing. And then Venomen just sings him into the mud. And then, like, in the mud is obviously a metaphor for him that almost killing him, and Jokahan then is like, please don't kill me, please don't kill me, I give you everything I want, you want, and they're like, yeah, what can you give me, and he's like, I can give you gold, I can give you silver, I can... and he's like, I don't need that stuff, I got enough of that on my own, and then he's like, I'll give you my sister for wife, and obviously he has no right to do that, but Venomenon says, yeah, sure, that's, we got a deal, go home, I'll come and collect later. Um... That's another motif that runs through the entire thing is, as I said, people from the south want to get wives in the north. And Venomen never gets one. <laughs> and even though Ilmarinen gets one, he's, it doesn't end happy either. So, Venomen goes north to pick up his promised bride. And she isn't happy about it, so actually she runs away and kills herself. Which, yeah, is terrible. <laughs> and uh, Venomen is really sad about it and just goes back home. And actually then he decides to go further to the north and talk to Lohi and ask her for her other daughter. It's not quite clear if the, like, the first one that dies is also a daughter of Lohi. I don't think so, but I might have misread it because, you know, it's a lot of names and it's a long book. And he gets, like, a lot of ridiculous tasks to fulfill, and he's like, yeah, I'll do all of those things, and he does all of them. And then Lohi says, yeah, but, you know, you also have to forge the sample for me, and you don't want to know what the sample is? I mean, you obviously want to know, but I cannot tell you because no one knows. It's like the absolute Ur MacGuffin, basically. It's this magical machine that brings riches, and I... That like, everyone wants it. And, she, and she's like, um, yeah, Venomen, you can get my daughter, but you have to forge the sample. And he's like, I don't know how to do that. But I know a guy who can do it. So he goes back home and tricks his brother to go to the north. <laughs> and his brother goes to the north uh, by trickery, obviously. And he actually manages to forge the sample because he's Ilmarin and the smith. He forged the sky. So if you're wondering what the, where the band name Skyforgers comes from, Skyforger, or the um, song Skyforger, yeah, that's that guy. <laughs> He's just like your typical Skyforging god uh, slash hero. And he forges a sample. 
And he, after some more trouble, he actually gets the girl. And, uh, yeah, I've left out the uh, Lemminkainen part so far. <clears throat> Let's switch to him for a while. Lemminkainen is a terrible person. He's young, he's good-looking, he's a ladies' man, and that's basically what he does. And he's then goes to an island to find himself a wife that he's sort of not supposed to get, and the way he gets her is kind of problematic, but you know, it's 18th, it's 19th century poetry, <clears throat> not sure how violent that abduction actually is or not, but we come to that later again. Anyway, Lemminkainen does that, gets home, and they make uh, like promises to each other uh, that they're husband and wife, but he is not going to war, and she is not going to uh, visit her family, and they live happy, happily ever after for like a week or so. And then she visits her friends, whatever that means in like, you know, metaphors. And he's really angry and decides to go to the north and fight because, yeah, that's how, that's the kind of guy he is. And his mother, he's, that's interesting actually, for a ladies man and all out hero, strong, good looking, he's very, very attached to his mother. And his mother's like, no, please don't go. It's gonna kill you. And he's like, yeah, you're my mother. Who are you to tell me anything? And she's like, well, it will end bad for you. And he's like, okay, here's the deal. Here's my hairbrush. Obviously, hair hygiene is big in prehistoric Finland. So here's my hairbrush. And if it starts bleeding, you know I've died. And so he marches off to the north and walks into um, the house of Lohi, mistress of the north, and starts, like, bewitching everyone in there. He sings a song and turns them all into, uh, yeah, sings them away, basically, except one guy who's like a blind herdsman, and he's like, you know, um, you're too mean to actually do anything, so I won't curse you. And then the blind guy runs away. He's like, yeah, we'll see about that, my friend. Friendo. <laughs> and <laughs> then Mistress of the North, lo, he gives him some tasks. He has to hunt the demon elk, which he does, and other things. I mean, also, I really love the idea of a demon elk. Anyway, he does all of those things, except the last one, which is go and fetch the Swan of Tuonila. Tuonila is the realm of the dead and also a river. Yeah, geography is not like how these things work. Anyway, and he's on his way there to catch that swan. And who does he meet but the blind spawned herdsman? And he kills him. So he, yeah, he kills him. He falls into the river of Tuandila. At his mother's home, the hairbrush starts bleeding. So she knows what happens. She walks to the north, figures out, oh, he's dead. He is in the river. What am I going to do? And now we come to something which friends of the Egyptian mythology might find familiar. So what she does is, although in this case she's the mother and not the uh, sister and wife at the same time, there's very little incest in this book. And if it happens, it actually turns out really badly. Anyway, so... She actually goes and finds Smith Ilmarin, who is like the go-to guy, the go-to guy when you need something fixed, and he makes a rake for her. So she goes back to Tuonila and starts raking the river and picks out all the different um, pieces of his body. This is like pretty graphic, and she puts them all together, and then she sends a bee. Bees are really important in this, because honey is also super important, and she sends a bee to the sun and the moon to fetch, like, medicine, and she heals him back to life, and then he comes back home with her. And that's where we leave him for a while, but he's gonna cause some more trouble later on. All right, where were we? Um... Right, um, the sample was forged. I forgot to tell the story that is also important. When our friend Wainamainen tries to go to the north, to, um, that's like before, when he goes to the north to woo and unsuccessfully woo the daughter of uh, the mistress of the north, 
our good friend Jokaheinen, the uh, guy from the beginning, he decides to kill Wainamainen. It doesn't work out that way because he only shoots his horse and Wainamainen falls into like the uh, falls into the sea. There's a canto which is translated as the castaway and if you have certain amorphous albums you might know that song. So yeah, that's he basically dry, drifts in the sea for a while, then washes up in the north and then meets um Lohi and she's like, yeah, if you want my daughter, you got to do, you got to forge a sample. And he's like, okay, I'll get you Ilmarinen. So yeah, that's what I forgot earlier on. So Ilmarinen forged the sample and he gets the girl. And then we come to the amazing wedding party. We learn a lot of things there. There's an entire chapter on how to make beer and how they prepare the feast. There's the chapter, there's like a long description because what always happens is things happen and then Wainamönnen sings a song about it, which he obviously does in this case again. How does this, and he describes in this song, this is amazing, it's really funny, in this, like, he sings a song about the, um, where he describes all the different people, like the bride, the bridegroom, the um, best man, which is not a best man, it's just a translation, it's a Finnish term I forgot, Again, a friend told me that in detail. So it's a sort of shaman, sorcerer, sorceress, which presides over marriage rituals in Lapland. He describes this person's um, attire in loving detail, <laughs> mentioning, and I find this super funny, that the person has real German shoes. So I always imagine him like dressed in this cliche pagan clothes and uh, just wearing Birkenstocks, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> okay, so the wedding happens and um, everyone's happy, except our good friend Lemminkainen, because he's not invited. So he's obviously pissed off and decides to go anyway, and <laughs> we know how great that <laughs> will turn out. Anyway, he starts and... He goes there, arrives there, behaves really rudely. Everyone else behaves really rudely. Um, fights happen, people die, things get smashed. And in the end, he has to flee because Lohi, Mistress of the North, has um, um, sung up an entire army. So he has to flee back home. And his mother is like, that's not good, son. I told you to do not do that because every time he decides something, his mother says, don't do that. And he said, like, who are you to tell me, mother? And does it anyway. So in this case, he goes back and whines. Yeah, I told you nothing good will come of this. But here's a trick. Go to this island and hide there for a couple of years until all of this blows over. Um, he does that. And when he comes back, every place is burnt down by the people from the north. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go back and kill them all. And she's like, no, don't do that. And then he decides to just rebuild bigger and better. It's sort of like a World Trade Center and one World Trade Center situation there going on. Okay, so that's also what happens. Now we switch into the Kulervo story. Um, maybe I should... I should have write those names down, I guess. Anyway, in the notes, I'll try that. Um, so we come to the Kulervo story, and this is something that will be very, very familiar to people who have read The Children of Hurin by J.R.R. Tolkien, or read The Silmarillion by Tolkien, because he sort of liked that story. So Kulervo is the son of Kalervo. Kalervo has a brother. The brother attacks Kalervo, kills more or less everyone, takes Kulervo with him, treats him really shittily as a kid and sells him as a slave to Ilmarin. Um, like, Kulervo also, like, in his childhood, he behaves really, he's someone who has low impulse control and all the other things that come with a troubled childhood. And he's sold to Ilmarin and his job is to herd the cows and other animals like sheep. And the person who give to give him that job is Ilmarinen's wife, which you remember is the daughter of the Northland, which was like, you know, gotten in exchange for forging a magical coffee maker or whatever it is. So what happens? She treats him 
shittily she puts she bakes some stone into his lunch bread. He finds out about it and his favorite knife, which his father gave him, breaks when he cuts open his bread because it comes like cracks on that stone. And he decides to <laughs> get his own back by first killing all the cows and sending them into like um, the swamps to be eaten by wolves and bears. And then instead of that, bringing back a herd of wolves and bears and magically makes sure that she doesn't find out. And then she gets eaten by wolves and bears in revenge for putting stone in his bread. Looking at medieval bread baking practices and iron forging techniques, I think it's sort of an overreaction, but you know. Anyway, he kills Ilmarinen's wife, and we know that's not going to end good, and then runs off. And actually, after a while, finds out his family is still alive, by which I mean his mother is still alive. She tells him that, yeah, his younger sister, like, walked away into the forest looking for berries and never came back and is probably also dead. And his father is still there, though. And he's like, he, he tries different jobs and he fails at all those jobs. And then he becomes like a tax collector. And on his way back from tax collecting, he meets this young girl that he is very attracted to and being the um, prehistoric uh, male figure he does what he shouldn't do and forces her to his will and then the next morning he finds out like they find out that actually she was his sister which is not good so she runs away and kills herself he is also not in the most stable frame of mind like I mean he's terribly sorry he grieves for her he goes home and tells his mother all about it and says you know i'll go and kill like my father's brother whom, whose name i really forgot um no I'm not gonna look it up now anyway i'm gonna kill him and all his folk in revenge because you know they took me away and sold me as a slave and forced like you into hiding when my sister got lost and he's the reason for everything so i'm killing him and then all will be well and his mother says no that's not gonna work at all i'm pretty sure not it's not gonna work anyway Kulervo runs off and decides to do exactly that and he's successful he kills everyone comes back home and when he comes back home he finds his home is empty, his mother is dead, his father is dead, his older sister and like everyone is dead and he's all alone and he goes to the place where his sister died, uh, killed herself and he throws himself on his sword. I mean, this is gruesome, but as I said, if you read the story about Turin, Turambar and um, his sister, that's basically where it's more or less lifted from. Just add elves and dwarves and you're good. I mean, even the sword talks to him before he kill it. <laughs> it says more or less the same things that Gurthang say to, uh, says to Turin at that point. Anyway, so, where do we find ourselves? Kulervo is dead, Ilmarinen's wife is dead, Ilmarinen is unhappy, Vainamen still doesn't have a wife. Um, what we're gonna do now? Um, yeah, I forgot to tell another story which is also in there, which is when Vainamen tries to build a boat, and to build a boat he actually, um, has to find boat making spells which were eaten by this giant and because he, had, he has eaten all these spells and Vainamenin falls into the giant's mouth and then starts making a fire in the giant's belly and until the <coughs> tortures the giant until the giant lets him out again and gives him the spells it's sort of if the whale that Jonah fell into was also this um, home improvement store that has all these tools for making boats that's also something that happens at some point. Um, anyway, so Ilmarinen decides, since he doesn't have a wife anymore, to forge himself one. I mean, right? He's the uh, he's the handyman. He repairs everything. He creates samples, forges skies, whatever you have. Shouldn't he also be able to do that? And he forges himself a bride made out of gold and silver. And yeah, Amorphous also have a song about that. As you know, it's called The Silver Bride. But it doesn't work. <clears throat> the Silver Bride doesn't come alive and Ilmarinen 
is sad. And then Vainamainen says, you know, you don't have a wife anymore, but those people in Northland still have that sample. Maybe we should do something about it. So they decide to go there and get the sample. And they go there and like, hey, you know, we should get some of the riches that you get from the sample. And the Northlanders say, no, forget it. It's our sample. And then Vainamainen says, okay, if you're not giving us some of it, we're going to take the whole damn thing. And he sings a spell and everyone falls asleep. And they steal the sample and try to carry it home. Unfortunately, the mistress of the Northland, Lohi, wakes up and transforms herself, sings herself into a, uh, an eagle and um, follows Vainamainen, Lemminkainen and Ilmarin on that boat and they have the Sampo with them. There's a battle and the Sampo gets destroyed. And yeah, the Sampo gets destroyed, but the pieces wash up partly in the south, but none in the north. So there's riches in the south now, just not as much as there were before. And the north gets nothing. So our mistress of the Northland is really angry. What she does? Well, it's pretty simple. She just takes the sun and the moon and locks them up. Although before that, she does other things. Right. Yeah, first of all, she sends plagues. Plagues, the usual thing, what you do when you're angry, you, you like you send plagues. Vainamainen, our great singer, man of calm waters, as it's called, he goes into the sauna, he talks to the great god and creator, who may be called Uko, maybe, and he manages to actually get rid of the plague. So next of all, our good friend Lohi, mistress of the Northland, in the translation I read, <laughs> she's also like, has the epithet of like, that gap tooth tag, which is super brutal. Anyway, <laughs> so Lohi, sings up a giant bear and Vainamainen goes a bear hunting, which is weird because he doesn't kill the bear or kills the bear or maybe sings the bear asleep and the bear falls down somewhere and then he's dead. And then we get like a long monologue where our good friend Vainamainen talks to the bear and he's calling him some really creepy shit like, uh, the sweet honey paws and all kinds of other pet names so you're wondering is he in love with that bear is he just good friends with the bear um then they eat the bear but he's still talking to him like that and then the bear's skull ends up in a tree but he's still sweet honey paws my lucky lad and um, yeah what you might notice on the, this point by those small quotes i just dropped is vainamain and talks a lot like Tom Bombadil. So this whole singing stuff into other stuff and having all these repetitions with these sort of slightly nonsensical words and stuff, it's something that Tolkien very much lifted from like the Kalevala for his Tom Bombadil person. It's he's not all Vainamainen, but you can see you can see the whole concept, the whole um um, character shine through in Tom Bombadil. So yeah, you got that. Um, so the bear is uh, dead um, and Lohi steals the sun and the moon. And Smith Ilmarinen uh, does the usual thing. He um, creates a sun and a moon out of silver and gold, but they don't work. So they decide to actually um, steal the sun and the moon. And it doesn't really work, but... Um, Ilmarinen tells Lohi that he's forging a chain to actually um, put her into chains until unless she gives back the sun and the moon. So she does that and gives back the sun and the moon. And then everything is happy. And we come to the last chapter, which is amazing. So the last chapter switches to our young maid. It's very important that she's a maiden. She's a virgin. Um, Mariata. And she eats a berry while tending to her sheep. And then suddenly she's pregnant. And <laughs> it's so good. So she's pregnant and <laughs> she finds no place, no sauna to actually, because all the important things happen in a sauna there. It's that's very true. <laughs> yeah, she finds, she finds no sauna and then she sends her like, made to go to that guy called Herod and ask him for a sauna and he says no there's no sauna but you know there's this small 
barn, stable, somewhere out on the moors in the forest with bears and wolves around. And just in the middle of the forest, there's a small stable. You can go there to sauna and get your child. And she does that. And, well, what we learn is the following. Um, yeah, the child is amazing. He's the son of God, obviously. That's sort of said straight up in the book. And she wants him, yeah, people want to know what to do with him. And Vaynerman is just like, you know, he's born out of wedlock. We should actually kill him. Then the son starts, the, the kid starts talking to him and telling him, who are you to know anything? You have no idea about law. You're old. What do you want to do? Boomer. And Vaynerman, and then they baptize the kid and it is baptized the king of Karelia and Vaynerman is, all right, if that's how you want to play it, that's how we're going to play it. He drops his cantilever and leaves, which is like the most epic mic drop ever because the cantilever is very important for him to make his music. It's like bound up in Finnish uh, uh, folklore. There are songs about it. It's I actually have a cantilever uh, somewhere, but it's out of tune, so I won't show it to you. It's sort of like a harp lyre kind of stringed instrument he built it out of a fish jawbone to start with and later out a second one out of wood now he just drops and just leaves everyone and like yo see how you're gonna get on with this christianity the end okay that's sort of what you all missed in the kalevala in roughly 20 minutes or however long i've talked already is it worth reading I would say yes. Try to find a translation that works for you. I've read one from someone called Keith Bosley. I actually listened to it on uh, on Audible. But yeah, that one works for English. It does actually sort of try to find its own meter. And if you're into mythology, I can highly recommend it. It has some weird twists, especially when it comes to bears or the general idea of everyone going to the north, trying to find a woman, never finding one, everyone ends unhappy. Also, there's this formulation that I really love. Like every time someone is sad, it's always like he has his head bowed, his helmet all askew, and it's like, this is just a glorious way to describe it. I, I love that. So yeah, that's a really cool book if you're into mythology. Which bands have sung about it? Well, a lot. Obviously, Amorphis, Sentence in North From Here, Turisas at some point in the... Um, it's called Cursed Be Iron or whatever that song is on the second album. That actually sort of takes some of the poetry, the poem's lines on how iron was for, uh, made. So yeah, that that one you get, and <clears throat> Moon Sorrow. So a lot of Finnish bands sing about the Kalevala because, you know, <laughs> it's sort of a local myth kind of thing. And obviously you all should listen to the band Kalevala and their album People Know Names from like the late 60s. It's perfect, weird folk progressive rock and i cannot <laughs> recommend it highly enough go get that if you get nothing else out of this video check that out otherwise listen to either amorphous or moon sorrow or any other of those finnish bands that look into that kind of folklore and as I already said there's a lot of that that went over into tolkien and we probably got to talk about tolkien at some point probably i should like make 20 videos about which chapter in lord of the rings is sung about by which band and which point and so forth but anyway if you like that yeah please tell me in the comments if you hated it tell me in the comments um subscribe to the channel do all the usual things and if there's books you really want me to talk about then let me know anyway this is like the first edition of scrolls of scalos cheers <laughs>